I have the challenge of being 3.15 in the afternoon, so um, I listened to all the presentations, as many as I could, and I realized that a lot of the dialogue is about the last mile. And I'm not doing the last mile at all, and so I thought I'd take a second and frame perspective. So um, I was pretty lucky about five years ago, I was invited to start a health innovation center to really think about change at, um, at full scale, 40% less expensive, 100 times better consumer experience. And I invited about 40 CEOs from around the industry, but retail, consumer tech, genomics, behavioral health, capital markets, health plans, health systems, and this band of, of people has been with me now for a five-year journey. And we're, we're working together to try to think much bigger. And so a couple of observations that I had is we've been in largely impatient lens today. I won't be. <laughs> I'm going to be in consumer lens. Mostly we've been in the $3 trillion sick care economy that's been organized by sick codes and a plan of benefits. I will, but I won't live there. I'm going to be in a $6 trillion economy that's health and wellness and fitness and food and transportation and consumer tech. And I'm going to stretch it. And then I'm going to ask if you want to, to come with me on the journey of thinking about having our marketplace start and stop as the consumer would want it to start and stop, not just where the sick code starts and the sick code stops. So if you're willing to go with me on that, that would be awesome. And then I've tried to organize this into a bit of a story. And I'd like to introduce you to Act 1, which is hopeful. And then in Act 2, we're going to have kind of a wake-up call. And we'll talk about some understanding. And I'll ask you to think about whether the things that you're doing now are really significant enough or integrated enough or holistic enough to really make a difference. Are they really, really going to make a difference? And then we'll transition into discovery. I'm actually going to introduce you to um, three models that I think could potentially disrupt the industry. And I'm actively seeking in the industry platforms that could be integrated platforms of change things that could actually create an alternative for the healthcare marketplace. And this, this, I didn't hear this in the other presentations, but I'm a fierce believer in the capital markets. I'm a fierce believer in transparency. And I'm a fierce believer in open competition actually driving the innovation. So the innovation isn't in an innovation center. It's fine if it is, but it's actually core to the model. We're beginning to change the basis of competition and that the consumer market will actually begin to reward how those changes work in share and in profits and a return on capital. So are you with me so far? Yeah, this is, <laughs> and I listened to the last presentation, which was great, and then I was trying to think how it would feel to you uh, to be in the room listening all day, and I know that's a high bar to be able to do for the full day, so I'll try to keep my energy level up for you, and then I hope that the message will, uh, will be enough to kind of keep you engaged. So, um, so Mark McClellan spent you know, probably 30 minutes talking about um, Obamacare and, and some of the fee-for-service changes. And I've got one square that I'm going to spend about 15 seconds on. And what I want to say is, is that um, at this point in time, um, I think we have a perfect storm happening, which is a convergence of forces. And in the top row, these are really market-driven forces. And, and the government's highlighted, and I never thought in, in my whole life that I would say that the government would be an innovator, but I actually feel a lot of healthcare is being innovated by the government on the top row through ACA and creating a consumer market, and on the bottom row through changing the regulatory framework and moving us to a value-based payment model. At the same time, consumers who li live in a web service-based world and have more accountability want to close the gap between, between responsibility and financial affordability, and they don't have tools, and they're hungry for them, and they have them in the rest of their lives, and the consumer tech industry is actually helping to fuel that change, which I think is going to be incredibly important. And then, of course, the consumer tech marketplace looks at this space really with envy. It's a dream come true. They're very good at cracking the code on the hassle map, and they'll work at that to bring new solutions to market. I'll probably share 20 examples of those as we go through. And then at the same time, our self-funded employers, who I thought actually might back out of the market, have upped the game to be a laboratory for innovation. And our self-funded employers, those that are, you know, that are in the upper part of the marketplace, are aggressively grabbing on to new technologies around how to manage chronic care, um, around transparency and consumer shopping, and trying to bring them to market. Because in part, health plans haven't really championed that change. And I, I, I noticed when hands went up, there was one health plan person. So if you're doing it, I hope you're doing it. I really do hope that you're doing it. Uh, but if you're not, um, self-funded employers are beginning to actually be that innovation lab. 
The regulators are, are dealing with a forced March to value-based payment. I completely agree with the comments that were made earlier. It's very difficult to make the change in this marketplace profitably if we stay in a fee-for-service model that rewards transactions and really doesn't ring the cash register unless we have a sick code in play. And then the capital markets really up until uh, the first quarter of this year have been on fire in terms of funding the IPO marketplace. But even, even the capital market's posture towards healthcare, um, particularly consumer tech-oriented healthcare, has been very favorable with billions of dollars of flowing in, which is um, creating a lot of opportunity for the innovators to help come in and disrupt the market. And so um, we know everybody on this page. We know them very well. Um, we didn't think they were going to do a lot when they started. They started 25 years ago. Um, three of these companies have a billion customers. They're digital. Their marketplaces are completely global. Their market capitalizations are somewhere in the range, where well, they're massive, but they're somewhere in the range of 10 to 60 times higher than the market capitalizations on as a percentage of HCA or United Healthcare, or Aetna, or Anthem, or any of the players in this space. And so they have the ability to compete in the capital markets in a way that we never thought possible, in a way that dwarfs the scale of what's happening here. And so while you're processing that, I wonder whether these players will be able to play a ma massive role in digitizing health. Take Google. I, I hear at least, I've heard this three times in the marketplace right now. We know it's public that Google made an investment in Oscar. We know they're keenly interested in precision medicine. And I'm hearing in the market they're in the process of gathering 50 insurance licenses to compete nationally as an insurer, maybe on the behalf of Oscar, or maybe as a new player coming into the market space. Their capital structure is different. Their level of intensity of knowledge about being consumer driven is massive compared to how we experience a patient because we only see the patient through the patient lens. And then what I think is most startling is, is that we have two new players, which I know you know, which I have to keep updating the slide because Uber went from 50 billion to $62 billion of market cap. Meanwhile, Airbnb is more valuable than Marriott and has actually no owned assets, shocking. But now we have these two new players and they're reinventing the model, but what's interesting is they've done it in five years. And these two players actually share about $85 billion of market cap right now on small revenue. Their market capitalization to revenue ratios are in the 50 to 60 times what we'd have. Their access to capital is limitless, but they've optimized the ability to connect with the consumer and actually take assets that they don't own and organize them into a marketplace. And I kept thinking about it, I'm thinking, I want my PPO to be that way, right? I'm thinking, I want my PPO, I'll take that, I'll take the Uber version, I'll take the Amazon version, but I want to be able to shop in a transparent marketplace, and when uh, I make very good decisions, thank you very much, I'd actually like to take the benefit of my economic decision making and put it in my pocket so I can help to afford my high deductible plan or my high copay. And right now when I make a good decision, a less expensive MRI, where does the money go? Well, the arbitrage between what I selected and what is the market-based pricing goes to the health plan right now. And unfortunately in our space, unfortunately in our space, we have two profit models, one on the provider side and one on the health plan side, where the alignment between their profit motive and the consumer's best interest isn't always aligned. And so I'm going to mix digital and tech with consumer, and I'm going to say that really no one should win unless the consumer wins. And then the opportunity to do that and to power that through new web services is actually um, pretty amazing. And so um, when you think about your experience in every other element of your life, except for healthcare, it's open, it's transparent, it's social, it's always on, it's an intuitive, it learns you, it actually applies learning across lots of transactions with you daily so that it can actually be personal. It's triggered, it's real time, it's event driven. It knows where you are, it, it, it routes you to the drugstore because it knows what corner you're on. It's intuitive all the way through and it's a complete opposite of our experience on the healthcare side, which is opaque, it's difficult to navigate, it's hard to manage the transitions and when I'm faced with an incredibly important, difficult decision about my care, I'm reliant upon a very informal network to help me make that decision. I don't have tools to do it because we don't have transparency. And so I, I wonder about this, this disequilibrium that happens in the marketplace. And I know that as consumer tech comes in, if they're able to unlock that consumer demand, 
I think will begin to offset this. And if you can read the players at the bottom, there are about 20 industries, not one or two, but about 20 industries that have actually gone through this change and they've been tipped over by the demand side. We've allowed our health plans and our employers to do our bidding for us as consumers inside the healthcare market. We've lived in a supply chain oriented model really for the last three decades. So there are 10 technologies that I think that are going to be important. There are probably more than 10. In fact, I, <laughs> I was taking notes this morning with a couple of the presentations, and there was a lot of language um, that I actually wasn't familiar with. And I, I know a little bit about Bitcoin and some of the other pieces that were talked about. But um, so there are probably many more technologies than this. And I see a lot of innovation that's happening by technology. These 10 technologies, I think you're going to be very familiar with them. A couple uh, people mentioned the fiber optic networks, which I think are going to be um, incredibly important, you know, about smart cloud and mobile, mobile phone. But I think what's interesting is what happens when these are put together. And so I, I want to at least allow, and I'll build on this, but I want to allow for the conversation that new business designs are going to organize and integrate the technology to create a transformative experience. They're going to grab three things off of here and create a new business design like Glenn Tolman talked about for Livongo for managing people or helping people with chronic disease live better. And it's going to be that integration, that collective design that is going to allow that to happen. And when that happens, was everybody in the room for Glenn this morning at 1130? So when that happens, I'll, I'll hit this again later. I don't know if this occurred to you, but Glenn will learn more about people with diabetes in a week than an endo will learn in 10 years, not on the clinical detail part, but on how the person lives. Because he's actually going to be learning across thousands and thousands of people at a time, four or five interactions in a day. And so we have this notion of this insight race that's actually beginning to build, which is why Watson acquired Truven is beginning to come into the game. But, but it's going to redefine some of the learning, and that's going to come through these convergent technologies. And so when I take a step back and I think about Health Market 2.0, I think, well, it should be um, health and life together. It should be always on. It should be error free. It should be personalized and convenient and digital. There should be rewards. It should be preventative. I should expect if I give you my values, whether they be my Fitbit or they be my chronic care values, that the providers in the room will be tied into this in a real-time environment, and they'll prevent my adverse event because they'll have enough information to be able to be in tune with me, and they can vibrate my bracelet, send me a text message, call me on the phone, and be there for me when I need them to be. I'm also going to expect that their offices are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And maybe not physically in the clinic, but maybe through telehealth, or maybe through Walgreens, or maybe through Rite Aid, or maybe through, I oh, forgot they merged, or maybe through Walmart. But I'm actually going to have that in a seamless way. I'm going to change the boundaries of actually how I think about my business design. And so I picture a market, and this is the hopeful part, I picture a market where any of us will be able to shop and experience the market and make decisions in that marketplace in a way that's our way. It's curated for us. It works for us. It's designed around us. And it actually spans nutrition and wellness and stress and behavior and sick code cares in a single marketplace that's transparent. And for that, I'm hopeful. And I, and I haven't really done a lot of this. Mark did a little bit of this this morning. But the, the value-based care models that have been in market, many of them for over 15 years, they're absolutely capable of 25% better value with three to four times better experience. In Health 2.0, when we unlock consumer demand, think 40% better value, 1,000 times better consumer experience. And this is what we're on the edge of. So I, I believe, actually, that to be successful in this marketplace, if you think it's going to be consumer and it's going to be digital, I actually believe that it has to be 40% better value. Transparency and shopping is going to be an open part of the market if you're a provider. You need to be doing bundles and have pricing and outcomes and pain management and functional recovery be visible so that you can be shopped. 1,000 times better consumer experience, always on, multi-channel, integrated, so the phone, the web, the in-person are all in a seamless experience, real-time and predictive. And these are going to be just parts of being in the marketplace. And so I wasn't really sure, but when I listened to the dialogue this morning, I heard a lot of last mile about a single technology coming to a person to enable a single conversation or a conversation between a specialist and a primary care physician. And I'm thinking more broadly, more at the ecosystem level in terms of how these come out. And so welcome to Act Two. 
So I don't know if this has occurred to you, but I travel around the country actually quite a bit. And when I'm with my health systems, my health systems are very proud to tell me that they're launching um, new retail programs for their ambulatory world. They have a clinically integrated network. Uh, they've actually done some partnerships with some of the retail pharmacies. They've refined their referral model to drive volume. Actually, there's a couple of private equity players that are helping to drive that. They have built employed physician networks. They've kind of put their arms around the physician community and integrated them. Um, and they've obviously moved to enterprise health records. I think we, in part, have the government to thank for that because of the meaningful use um, rewards that were in place for that. But they've closed the market. They've integrated this marketplace. And, and, and I think those by themselves might be OK. But when juxtaposed against help me stay healthy, get me a real relationship, get rid of unwarranted practice variation, Think about me when I'm chronic, when I'm home, when I'm not eating right or my behavior's wrong, which is completely correlated to when I'm going to be symptomatic. The picture that's emerging on the consumer side for consumer demands, it doesn't really match the model. And so maybe it matches it at the edges inside of innovation, but it doesn't match it at the core. And I won't take the time because we don't have that much time, but the exact same pathway is true on the health plan side where we're building high deductible narrow networks that actually promote transactional volume and really aren't very consumer friendly at a time. It's the best pathway to lower cost, but at a time where the consumer demand and exposure and level of expectation is actually on the rise. It turns out, and, and five years ago, we actually sat down and tried to figure out who would win the race. And it turns out that the process of going from a fragmented fee-for-service healthcare system to a fully integrated, I, I love the new language around patient-centered medical home and actually having it at the patient-centered neighborhood or the patient-centered community, um, it's non-trivial. It, it takes four or five, six years. And when you're done with it, you've largely optimized all aspects of the sick care and the transitions of care and the primary care to specialist handoffs. And it's vastly better, probably 25% better, but it's still not retail. And so I have been wondering personally, and maybe you have a view about this, is if we're really going to go retail, will the health systems actually be able to drive the change? And what inside of this model might be popped out? Might chronic care management, like Glenn featured with Livongo, be something that largely isn't done in the clinic? It's largely done because how we live our daily lives has a lot to do with how healthy we stay. And that's better done in the cloud. And it's better done by a call center. And it's better done by a wireless device. And so we're in this process. And I keep wondering, well, how is the race going to go? And I know the race through people and culture and programs and benefit plans and reward systems, that pace is slow. And I know that the tail of capital usually chases its past habits. And so breaking how capital gets allocated is very hard to do and probably isn't actually possible without very strong leadership. And so um, are people in the room familiar with the idea of a hassle map? So I wondered about this because um, for those who are going to get really serious about the consumer experience, first of all, you're going to spend a lot of time living with the consumer and understanding their perspective so that you can design the new world from the consumer in. And, and I, I marvel, first of all, when we map this, <laughs> I mean, I knew it was going to not be very pretty, but it was actually less pretty than I thought. But then I, I marveled that we actually not only do it, but we built all the systems to automate it. <laughs> you know, it used to be five years ago, we had this, but it was a paper nightmare and there was leakage, but now, there's not, but we've actually cemented and embedded. We have reward systems for how well we do this. We have, you know, we have a training programs that are in place for how well we do this. And, and unfortunately, this map is a horrific map. It actually doesn't really map to consumer value very well at all and allows those consumers with those signs to really still be isolated from this environment. And so I wanted you to think when we went through this is that if you integrate telehealth and it's slick and it's on your phone and it knows what your calendar is, that's good. But it's not really going to drive systemic change unless the internal experience begins to reflect what you're marketing on that external experience. When we say multi-channel, multi-channel is always all, all about getting that cultural process flow, workflow alignment, so every touch of that consumer interaction has a common experience and common feel. And we don't feel the edge of this hassle map, which is 
complex enough by itself, but when you put it in the way of a person trying to get the right care at the right time or to navigate a really tough transition for a mom, a dad, or somebody in need, then the stakes of the Hasselbeck actually get expressed in very different language. So, so we wondered, and, and I won't go through all of this, but we wondered if you did have a fresh sheet of paper, and if you did do consumer focus groups, which we've done many, we've done journey maps and really gone through to try to understand, and you could pick these words probably comfortable, but are we really personalized to the consumer? What does that really mean? Do we, do we know their kids' names? Do we know what they eat? Do we know whether they have a social life? Do we know whether they go to church or have a church community? Do we know what's in their refrigerator? We probably don't know those things as a fragmented sick care, but maybe we do, and maybe in those, those hold the keys for actually helping them be more engaged. And so I won't take the time to go through each, but this notion of personalized, and I believe personalized is life event, real-time triggered. So personalized means, oh, I know you have a sick kid in the back seat. You're on a limited budget. You don't have insurance. You have to go to fill in the blank. Walgreens is on the corner. No waiting. Thank you very much. Um, empowered. So consumers actually have the ability to at least make good decisions that are commensurate with the accountability and the responsibility they carry under current plan designs. Uh, we have to do a vastly better job on fit and affordability. Easy and intuitive, that's everything. We're not in our hassle map. Um, in the daily living, so that our system doesn't stop at our four walls. It actually stops. It doesn't stop. It's with us. It's mobile. It's connected. It's biometric. It's live. Um, and it's real time. When you build your environment, how open should it be? Should you inv invite other people to invent things and put them in your environment so you can actually grow the experience? Because God knows that you won't be able, if you're living on the orthopedic side, it's unlikely you're going to solve the nutrition, wellness, behavioral health, depression, financing pieces. They're probably unlikely you're going to do that. You'll probably live inside of an ecosystem. And so as we open this up, and we go from sickness to consumer better living, and we go from single chain to multi chain, then all of a sudden it opens the possibilities of how this market um, is likely to unfold. And so um, we took a look, and actually my advisory board helped me a lot with this, but we took a look, and it, it turns out that a lot of people think they can add value. And it actually turns out that if you're in the health system sector, you're really only one of like 13 sectors. It also turns out that seven of the sectors on this chart didn't exist six years ago. And so people are looking at, that, at, at this space, and they're, uh, they're concentrating, trying to figure out how they might really create transformative value. And I'm, I'll give you a couple of disruptor plays that I think that I'm personally very excited about, um, because I actually think that they'll promote and, um, and initiate change in the marketplace, which I think, I think our marketplace would benefit a lot from a wake-up call. If you're a digital um, innovator inside your organization, it'd be awesome if leadership and the board said, we got the wake-up call, you know, we're going to go digital and consumer, let's triple the budget and make this happen. And so other players in this wheel are already thinking in that way. And we could go through a fair number of examples, which we'll get, at least get to a couple. And so, um, so I don't know if when you look out, when I look out, I think health plans have been supply chain managers. And health systems are working on being population health managers. I think they're doing good. Both those entities are moving pretty slowly. Retail pharmacies, like Walgreens, I think are trying to be a retail hub. I'll give you just a bit, because I've got to manage time, but just a bit. When I'm out in the market and talking to primary care, what percentage of primary care visits do you think primary care physicians would say could seen, be seen by a non-physician? Very good. You're higher than the average, and that's fine. So that supports the case very well. So when you're, when you're Walgreens and you're thinking about convenient care, and you know you could almost give the care away for what you're going to make on the pharmacy at the back of the store, and then you can send them home with chicken soup, what do you think? Revenue opportunity. Same store growth opportunity. So now if I can drop a box in that I would have said was made by Theranos a year ago, but now I can't, but instead I'll say it was made by Samsung, and I can do blood-based diagnostics and deliver them in about an hour and have a panel that's five times bigger than what I get from LabCorp and actually be priced at 40%, might I do that in my store? Sure, I might. And so now I integrate telehealth, now I have my bracelet, I do biometric monitoring, I sell the blood glucose meter, and I've got the call center connected because I'm Walgreens and I have 10,000 stores. And oh, by the way, I rolled out flu shots to 30,000 30, pharmacists. I actually understand change. And do you know that within a year, I'll do 300, when they're at scale, I'll do 300 million convenient care visits, and I'll have data on every one? Huh, that's kind of interesting. So, 
Walgreens might be an interesting hub, or Walmart might be an interesting hub, and they already have a cloud. They already understand data. They already, already understand how to roll things out at scale, and they certainly understand how to connect merchandising and store experience to the consumer, and they're redesigning their stores in a wellness format. And then we move over to consumer tech, and consumer, consumer tech is equally compelling, in fact, more compelling, just not quite as far along. I actually was really hoping that somebody like a WebMD would open up the consumer marketplace, and I keep hoping that Amazon's going to do it, but I actually think it'll be a small player that will get this started, and then we'll start to see a transparent, open marketplace like a PPO. But it'll be done by consumer tech. It will not be done by the incumbent. I'll leave for today precision medicine aside, but I actually think, and it was talked about before in one of the presentations, but I think the hub of whole genome and microbiome sequencing into life planning and risk management through a life cycle, prevention in a decade, not a week, I think that that will be part of our world in five years and will be more disruptive than almost anything that we've talked about. But I also think that with Walgreens doing Samsung or if Theranos gets their X square and convenient care, they're going to move from diagnosis to the cloud and have personalized treatment plan in the store, and they're going to begin to revolutionize that process in a total consumer experience. And so that's a platform. And so I want you to think about your platform. Where do you work? What is your platform? Is it the hospital? Is it the primary care group? Is it, is it a single technology? Can you integrate things around it? And then who wins on quality, satisfaction, and trust? Who do you think? You think Google wins? Health plans, uh, not, probably not. Providers, nah, well, some of them are loved and cherished, but not collectively. But when you think about error rates and the kinds of things that are expected in the environment, the precision, the quality, and the satisfaction as you move to the right on this particular chart are pretty, they're pretty mind-blowing. And in fact, I wish I had them inside of my healthcare, and I, I really wish I did. I didn't tell you this at the beginning, but uh, when I started the Innovation Center, I decided that my client was the consumer. And what I did, it was an epiphany, because all of a sudden, I'd spent my career helping HCA optimize cash flow when they, got, when they were taken private and roll out their ambulatory surgery centers, but price, shadow price them against inpatient. I was really, really good at helping the incumbents make a lot of money. And then I woke up, I'm like, oh my gosh. It's really good, their, their, their stock price is going to go up, but it's really not the same as being, making a commitment to being consumer-centered and creating consumer value. And so I've spent my time over the last five years talking in environments like this to bring that story to the market. In any other market outside of healthcare, the capital markets would sell it for us. It wouldn't even be a question. You heard Caremore get talked about this morning by Mark, and you know, Caremore is a company that delivers 30% better value for frail elders. Does anybody know when it was invented? 30 years ago, <laughs> they were doing biometric monitoring a decade ago. If we could have every senior use care more, we'd solve the Medicare crisis. But in healthcare, there's no, there's no replication. And trust me, private equity put 200 million in, they scaled it up, and Anthem bought it for $800 million and tried to roll it out. But they didn't really know how to. And so these, these kind of competitive dynamics don't really resonate in healthcare the way they do in other markets. And so, I think this is true. I've done the math. You could do the math. I could send you the sheet if you want to. But I actually think that it's true that we could all be sitting in a six to six and a half trillion dollar marketplace. I, I already know, go inside a Ford Motor Company or Mercedes Benz, they're already do, they're doing biometric monitoring in the seats and in the steering wheel. They already have accident statistics. But if you're a person with a condition, the automotive industry thinks that they'll be able to monitor you and save your life. Uh, because they're doing biometric mine. I'm not going to stake my bet on the market growing because automotive's getting in at all, but nutrition actually happens to be one of the market spaces that's bigger than healthcare. It's twice as big as healthcare, and I'm positive that the correlation between nutraceuticals and food has a massive impact on how we live, and it's largely divorced right now from our sick care system. So that will come in, and then Uber Health will get launched. We'll have transportation. Um, in the frail elder community, many don't make it to the clinic because they don't have transportation. I think transportation will be integrated into the model. Smart house, smart bed, smart bathroom, smart phone. These are going to be part of our marketplace. And they're going to, when they're in the market, they're going to change because the consumer is going to expect that kind of real-time connection. And so there's a very direct pathway. So the, the question, that should be exciting. It should be really exciting. Wow, growth opportunity of a lifetime. Very exciting. And then the question is, who captures the value? So I actually think the sick care market that's going to sit inside this combined market will contract. 
I think more than a trillion dollars of value will move from the incumbents to the new players unless the incumbents can begin to compete inside this new market. But they're short of a few skills to do that because they didn't really grow up as digital companies. They didn't grow up in that consumer mindset. And so, but I at least want you to hold in your mind this view of a vastly better marketplace where health and wellness starts and stops where the consumers need it to. Because it's a powerful framework. I hadn't said this before, but you probably know it. 15% of the population are polychronic. We know this. This is, this is Fred, my Honda, my hypertensive, obese, non-compliant, diabetic adult. That's my Honda, Fred. And so we know that the Freds of the world actually cost 60% of the healthcare dollars. We know that. So what happens? Are there problems because they're presenting symptomatically? Or are there problems that they don't eat well? They're depressed. They don't get off the couch. They don't have a social network. So this correlation, when somebody cracks the code and lives in the risk environment, they're going to realize that if they can serve the Freds of the world well, it'll be the center of their profit world, and it'll actually be integrative of this broader marketplace definition. So, so fun questions for you. I'm not done with the content part. Is everybody OK so far? Yeah? Anybody have a question you want to ask now? No? OK. So, um, so you can buzz through these questions. But these are great questions to ask you from a business design perspective. How much of it, do you even know what a hassle map is? And if you do, how much of it have you solved? How many industry boundaries did you actually cross in your model? Did you connect the transportation, the behavioral health, the community services, the church, the infrastructure to your model? Is your new value prop to the consumer? Is it really transformational? I can't imagine going backwards and living my life without Google or Amazon. I can't even imagine. I can't imagine having to sort through the news or not having the New York Times delivered with my headlines or my journal every morning with my, I can't, just can't even imagine. I can't imagine it not being integrated with my smartphone. And then when I figure out where I got to go on my calendar, it's already mapped. These are normal things, and they collapsed dozens of industries together. And the value prop was outsized, massively outsized, 10 times more for 20% the price. And so um, how much of your value comes from partnerships? I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the, in the Apple store, which is a massive revenue center, and Apple was that company that had $631 billion of market capital, um, pr pretty awesome, three times revenue and market, and market cap. But in the App Store, they did the starter, and they opened up open source. And so 75% of what's in their store was not made by them. They published the APIs. It's an open structure. And it's allowed them to participate in a broader economy, economy and it's allowed them through partnerships to meet a broader set of consumer needs. OK, you guys, this is the heaviest. The next one's the heaviest thinking part. Do you have it in you? Yeah, I see one thumbs up. The lights are down, so it's very hard. I can't really see faces. So um, I see body language. I see that table over there. And you're you know, a little. I can't tell. Are you guys OK? Yeah? OK. OK, cool. All right, so um, this idea of a multi-chain business design, it, it's really, if you think about what Apple and Amazon did, they collapsed media. They, they collapsed news, they collapsed music, they collapsed navigation, they collapsed phone, they collapsed chat and video. They invented five things that were really never there before. And so if you were in four or five other predecessor industries, largely you weren't in them anymore because they don't really exist. And so this, that's this idea of actually thinking about a multi-chain world. And so there are three very big pieces to this world, and I want to at least lay these out there for you to think about. They might help you connect your digital initiatives to where you're going in your business. And so. I think everybody is intuitively focused on, where do you think they're? They're focused on the upper right on this slide. I'm going to build an app, and it's going to create a really great experience. And of course, that app is going to compete with everybody else's app, and it may or may not be relevant because it may or may not be integrated with enough of the person's life to really create that personal experience. But the magnetic experience is incredibly important. And if informed and connected to the consumer's hassle map, where it would thrive on the top of your screen, your phone screen, then you're getting close. But another big element of this is to create a personalized marketplace. So when I pick up that app, if I pick up that app and there's a transparent PPO, I know that that personalized marketplace and the app together are going to let me get more value. They're going to let me afford my $5,000 deductible. They're going to let me um, skip out on my co-pays because I'm going to get rewarded for smart shopping. And then the intelligent hub is the rules. So when I call in, and I'm Sally, and I'm a single mother with two kids, the Intelligent Hub, and I have a high deductible plan, 
The intelligent hub knows I have to drop the kids to school on Thursday, so I'm solving for convenience and speed for convenient care today. But when my daughter falls on the playground, I've got to pick her up. They know I'm, I'm actually looking for value that day. So the intelligent hub is mapping the rules about us. So when you go to Facebook, Facebook knows more about our health than almost anybody. They have a whole health application that they're launching. But people talk about how they feel on Facebook. And if you sit down with the Facebook health people, they'll talk to you about it. And so if we live in a transactional world, which we do, many of us do, we're capturing data that's required for meaningful use, and then we're getting the rev cycle to get the bills out, are we really learning? And in the intelligent hub is that opportunity to capture those without it then actually how do we personalize the experience? And so these three concepts work together. If you were Lavongo, then you have an app and a device that help you create a magnetic personalized experience that can save your life. Your marketplace is automatic because it knows when you're out of supplies and they're shipped. But I'm learning across 10 million people that have diabetes about rules. And then I'm learning about you specifically. And I know that you eat pancakes on Saturday because your sugar levels spark, they jump up every Saturday morning. Or in Glenn's case, he knows that his football player at Penn State went out drinking on a Saturday night and crashed his blood sugar and got a call from a Lavongo coach that helped him save his life. And so that starts to get into these three components. And, and these are very powerful. So when you think about the examples, which we're going to do right now, you think about a smart care team or a population health manager. Um, I, I, love, I love the question about the physician that stood up and said, you know, I saw my, diabe my diabetic scores, and I'm like, oh my god, I've got about you know, 25 diabetics in my panel, and I, ha and I have no idea their blood sugar was out of, out of level. And so when I take you, if I were to take you to um, Iora Health, the company that Rashika um, actually developed with your next speaker <laughs> in tandem in, uh, in Las Vegas, um, they built a predictive model. And do you know what, what Rashika and his care team does every morning? They go through the list, and they have a predictive model that tells them about every patient that didn't schedule but could, but should have, because they have elevated risk factors. And they call them up, proactive, right? And so they're only able to do that because they're leveraging the intelligent hub to have the data and the insights to be able to be predictive and understand that kind of behavior. And so um, as we go through these, this whole concept of patient-centered medical home, if we took that patient-centered medical home and we collected the data, and we connected to Watson, and we had education programs, and we had telehealth integrated, and we made our website click through to Walgreens so we have automatic scheduling and CVS and Rite Aid and Walmart and our telehealth option. Now, all of a sudden, we start to open this up, and we have a physical, clinical centrality place in our model, but we also are building an intelligent hub, and we're gathering information about the people that we treat, and not just patient information, because we're going to grab the Fitbit. And we're going to grab the inhaler through Propeller, a company called Propeller, who makes a Wi-Fi inhaler already, that can tell you, like me this morning, I'm flying to Las Vegas from Chicago. Guess what? It's really dusty in Las Vegas. I suggest two puffs this morning, Tom. Message on my smartphone with my inhaler. My inhaler is wired in. I know what to do. I make the adjustment. Bam, I'm done. And so now I've got those kind of biometrics. And so Propel is already in the marketplace, are already available to a lot of people that are moving in that direction. But now all of a sudden, when I'm inside this smart care team, I'm starting to connect those dots. And I don't know if, if you did this already, but if you scan the left-hand side of this page, I've taken health, wellness, nutrition, coaching, monitoring, and better living, and I've squished them together. I'm not a sick code company anymore. Right now, the profit center for most primary care physicians is the seven-minute visit. It's very difficult. We over-refer right now because the economic model rewards our physicians to practice down their license. And when things are complex, they're pushed on, and the specialists pick them up. Thank goodness they do a good job, but it's still fragmented transactional medicine. In this case, with this hub, all of a sudden we've redefined we're connected to the home. Make sense? OK. All right, so I've done a bit of retail. Based on, uh, based on faces and language, I'm going to I'm going to skip past this, and I'm going to skip past the chronic care hub. And I'm going to just mention to you, which I've said before, that I think that when you're thinking digital and when you're thinking consumer experience, first of all, your models, which somebody else said today, will be more global. Your competition can be anywhere because of telehealth, because of new diagnostic technologies, because of web services. Your competitor can be almost anywhere. And you're in an insights race. 
And so I, I wonder a lot about how our fragmented physician base will have the capital structure, the IT expertise, and the volume to be able to first build the intelligent hub, but second, have enough insights unless they partner with a Watson or a Truven and begin to borrow those kinds of assets that they can flow into the smart workflow. Okay, and I'm, I'm gonna close on, um, on three or four slides about leadership. How many people in the room are in a senior leadership role in their organization? Okay, okay, so, so I, I, I believe that um, we're sitting at a place where if you're in an incumbent business model, there, there's nobody that's gonna take you out in the short term, but, we're, but you're going to have a gradual erosion of your business model, and there'll be new players that are gonna be coming into the market. And I believe that the opportunity to embrace consumer and to open up the model and to think ecosystem is an incredibly amazing opportunity that will lead to a sustainable healthcare market, but also will be highly correlated if you're, um, if you're mission oriented, be highly correlated to your mission because we're gonna deliver much better value care, be much more accessible, be much more personalized, and we're gonna fundamentally change engagement. And so, but this can't happen without a fresh look. And so if you're in a leadership role and somebody asks you what has to change, just about everything, culture, rewards, I'm sorry, Epic wasn't really designed to be consumer, the way you allocate your capital is not really designed, all the scores in your performance scorecard that drives your long-term incentive program, guess what, they're not consumer friendly, all the metrics inside your model are not, your physician-centric model that, um, that protects and takes care of your highest end specialist isn't really consumer-centric. Over time, we'll, we'll discover that um, frail elder models will actually significantly change that curve. But this can't happen without leadership, and leadership doesn't mean the edges. It doesn't mean a pilot. It doesn't mean carving out five million bucks and giving it to three guys in a garage. It doesn't mean piloting a little program or tip, tipping your toe, dipping your toe into the water on, um, on Medicare uh, performance gain program. It, it, it's a cultural systemic change. And so if you were up for that, and you could probably answer your own question and be based on the organizations that you're in and the boards that you have, if you were up for that task, then um, you would probably be having dialogue about building a consumer-centric culture. And so if we were to go down this path, seriously go down this path, consumer, consumer tech, digitally enabled, then all of a sudden marketplace partnerships doesn't mean geographic market. It actually means you know, who, who's going to be in my offering um, what partners am I going to have is, 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 is am I going to have a retail marketplace where Walgreens is going to be in a telehealth marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. How do they go get filled in? And then who's on my data science team? What happens with cognitive computing? I don't know if you've thought about it, but I don't think I would go and get personalized cancer treatment, particularly if it was a rare cancer, uh, unless that practice was using some version of however Watson and, and MSK will evolve where they're actually current on the literature and some future version of some sort of evidence-based guideline because I know all the statistics on uh, practice variability and biologic efficacy. And so this data science is gonna be a core part of what's happening. I don't think it's possible for us to keep up at the scale uh, that the world is changing. Somebody's gonna own the consumer experience. I'm, I get hired right now at Oliver Wyman frequently, come make, come make our primary care be the new front door, make it look like Walgreens. And I'm like, okay, are you talking about the front door or are you actually talking about creating a consumer culture? Which, which one is it? Because if we make your front door pretty and people come in and you don't treat them well, they're not gonna be very consumer friendly. And then when you refer them to the specialist, it's not gonna be very consumer friendly. And so this notion of actually being a consumer-centered organization, if you were to walk into Alignment or Caremore or Iora or Q Lions or Cornerstone, the culture is palpable. You feel it when you, you feel it even before you get to the door. It's a consumer-centered culture and the empowerment framework is very different. Um, and then you're gonna have a solution architecture designer because you're gonna be building brand new systems and things that are actually gonna work extraordinarily well based on the consumer's hassle map. And there's gonna be new competencies. And these competencies, when you look at them, they don't look like today's, they're different. And, and they, they're not intended to be overwhelming, they're intended to be informing. They exist in the market, these are some of the hottest labor market places, period, in terms of new graduates out of Stanford and out of Wharton um, that are coming into the marketplace. Uh, but the, they are incredibly important competencies that are gonna be required for you to fulfill your consumer digital vision as you reimagine your business design.